What's up, everybody? My name is Lucky the Librarian, your tour guide to the other side, and I want to welcome you back to another episode of Bay Area Babylon, where we explore the shadows of history and the stories that haunt us out here on this wild west coast. Now today, we're venturing just a bit outside the actual Bay Area to cover the disturbing legacy of the Yosemite Killer a troubled man whose crimes cast a dark shadow over America's most beloved national park. But I'll be taking you one step further today, because tonight I will actually stay overnight inside the motel where the Yosemite killer not only lived at, but where he claimed the lives of two of his victims. I'll be honest with you folks, my stomach has been doing flips, and I can honestly tell it's going to be a rough night. So cue the music and get ready to visit Cedar Lodge. Let's do this. Yosemite National Park has been a beloved destination for generations. People from all over the world have been drawn to the park's natural beauty, its towering granite mountains, the cascading waterfalls, and of course the serene meadows. But that's not all. Yosemite also offers all sorts of outdoor activities, from hiking to rock climbing to outdoor photography, making it a destination for both nature lovers and adventure seekers. But on the evening of February 15th, 1999, a shadow loomed over the valley, especially here at the Cedar Lodge Motel in the small mountain town of El Portal. Because as dusk fell over the Yosemite Valley, a mother, her daughter, and a family friend of theirs all found themselves caught inside the dark embrace of the remote lodge, just located eight miles outside the park's main entrance. The girls were settling in for the night here in room 509, they were ready to watch a movie they'd rented from the motel, when out of nowhere, they heard a knock at the door. It was the motel's handyman, and when asked what he wanted, he said he was just stopping by to fix a leak in the bathroom. The three tourists thought it was a bit strange. They hadn't noticed or reported a water leak, but still, the trusting trio invited the handyman inside their room. It was a decision they would ultimately regret. Carol Sund age 42, and her 15-year-old daughter, Juliana, wanted their trip to Yosemite to be a memorable one. That's because they'd brought a friend of the family along with them, 16-year-old Silvina Peloso, an exchange student from Argentina. Now Carol, well, she was real tight with Silvina's mother. They'd formed a friendship back when she herself was a foreign exchange student studying in Argentina nearly 30 years prior. And now, both their daughters had formed a similar lasting bond that mirrored both their mother's friendship. And with Sylvina in town, and Julie just finishing up a cheerleading contest over in Stockton, the three were ready for some fun and adventure. But sadly, and unfortunately, the handyman, well, he was also looking for some fun, only a much darker, more sinister type. Once inside the room, the handyman pretended to inspect the leak in the bathroom. Then before they could react, he pulled out a gun and overpowered all three women, binding and gagging each one of them. The handyman placed the girls on the bed, then proceeded to strangle Carol right there in front of the two terrified girls, before sexually assaulting each one of them. Next, the mad dog lunatic took Sylvina to the bathroom, and he placed her right in the bathtub, right here, and he strangled the poor girl to death and placed both her corpse and Carol's inside the trunk of the Pontiac Grand Prix the trio had rented for their trip. The killer then drove the car down Highway 108, nearing the small town of Long Barn. Just north of the highway, he ditched the car with the two corpses still inside. Then he called a taxi to pick them up. He later returned to the car and torched it to a crisp. And as for Julie, well, that poor girl received the worst of it. She was assaulted multiple times, tortured, and then driven to a secluded area overlooking Lake Don Pedro, where the maniac then said to the girl, I love you, before slitting her throat, nearly decapitating her entire head. He then left her lifeless body out there alone in the wilderness. The killer then walked two miles to one of the little mountain villages and called for another taxi. Much later, the taxi driver reported to the police that the peculiar man she'd given a ride to had asked her multiple times whether or not she believed in Bigfoot because he in fact claimed he had. Now apparently this dude had such an obsession with Bigfoot, he later reported to the police that he had an encounter with the mythical beast when he was a kid right here in Yosemite. 
but I digress. Now, the following day, Carol's son's husband waited for his wife and daughter at San Francisco International Airport, where the family was going to meet up before flying on to Phoenix. But unfortunately, Julie and Carol never arrived. The husband continued on to Phoenix himself, played a few rounds of golf. When he didn't hear from his girls, he eventually ended up reporting them missing. Now, initially, police just assumed that the car veered off the road. It was wintertime. And the winding roads and switchbacks in the area plunged into steep, dark canyons. It was the most probable explanation that they could come up with. And a massive search was launched thereafter. The authorities got thrown a huge curveball several days later when Julie's son's wallet and driver's license were turned into the police over in the town of Modesto. Then, a month later on March 18th, the mystery of the missing tourists took a grim turn. And that's when a man out hiking he discovered the burned out rental car. When police arrived the next day, they discovered Carol's son and Sylvina Peloso's charred remains inside the trunk of the car. Their bodies were burned with crisp, making them completely unrecognizable. But thanks to dental records, their identities were confirmed. Several days later, police received an anonymous note with a diagram drawn on it. This indicated where Julie's body was located. And if that wasn't disturbing enough, the killer had written a personalized note to the police, taunting them and saying, quote, we had fun with this one, end quote. The police then followed the map and actually recovered Julie's son's lifeless body. Now around this time, the authorities began poking around the Cedar Lodge Motel here, questioning staff members and suspicious looking locals who milled about town. One of the motel employees questioned was this good looking, friendly guy named Kerry Stainer. Now Stainer didn't set off right at the start any alarm bells when being questioned. And overall, it was pretty cooperative, showing them into various rooms around the lodge here as they collected fiber samples. With no reason to suspect this guy for any wrongdoing, the cops let him get back to work, taking care of the property here. Now, what the police did not know at this time was that Carrie Stainer's early life was marked by significant trauma and instability. His younger brother, Stephen Stainer, was famously kidnapped when he was only seven years old and then held captive by a pedophile named Kenneth Parnell. When Stephen was a teenager, Kenneth Parnell kidnapped another little boy, this time a five-year-old boy from Ukiah, California, and he held him captive for two weeks before Stephen said enough was enough. Then risking his own life, Stephen Stainer escaped from Parnell's clutches and took little Timothy White to the police. Stephen Stainer was eventually reunited with his family and hailed as a hero. Stephen's disappearance and eventual return was very, very heavily covered by the media. In fact, Hollywood produced a made-for-TV movie about the incident titled, I Know My First Name Is Stephen. Now I have to say that seeing this movie when I was just a kid myself, well, I was still pretty traumatic and I was leery of all strangers after that. Now, Kenneth Parnell, he was convicted on kidnapping and false imprisonment charges. But here's the insane part. He was sentenced to only seven years in prison and only served five of those. Less time than he actually held poor Stephen Stainer captive. I don't know what to say about that, but what the actual fuck? If I had my way, Kenneth Parnell should have been hung by his heels and beaten with fungo bats. By the age of 24, Stephen Stainer had become a husband and a father of two. But then late one night, he was tragically killed in a motorcycle crash. To add to the grief and sorrow, not long after Stephen died, Carrie Stainer's uncle was fatally shot in the home that the two men had shared, leading Carrie to a series of mental, nervous breakdowns. Carrie's struggle with mental health issues, combined with his desire for attention and notoriety, eventually led him to attempting suicide. Carrie later claimed that the entire ordeal with his brothers being kidnapped had left a deep scar on his psyche. So much so, that he always had to wear a baseball cap because he was compulsively pulling his own hair out. After the suicide attempt, Carrie began acting wildly inappropriate towards women, and it was reported that he even exposed himself to one of his sister's friends. Eventually, Carrie Stainer moved to El Portal to be close to Yosemite because he loved the serene environment so much. But that wasn't the only reason. He also wanted to move there to be close to Yosemite so he could continue looking for, guess what? So, Terry moved into a room directly over the restaurant here at the Cedar Lodge, and that's where he became the motel's handyman. And by the time July of 1999 rolled around, police were no closer to catching the tourist killer than when they had started. And as things weren't bad enough already, well, 
Let me tell you folks, the shit really hit the fan on July 22nd, and Carrie Stannard crossed paths with a 26-year-old naturalist who worked for Yosemite National Park named Joey Armstrong. Joey was living with her boyfriend in a section of the park named Forestra. When Stanner first saw her, she'd been packing up her car for a trip to Sausalito, and that's when Stanner pulled up in his 1972 Leaf Scout and attempted to make small talk. Now, Joey very quickly realized that something was quite off with Stanner, especially when he began to make small talk about, well, you probably guessed it by now, Bigfoot. Joey politely tried to disengage and get back to her packing, and that's when Carrie Stanner pulled out a gun and drew down on her. He ordered her inside her cabin, where he tied up her hands and covered her mouth with duct tape before placing her into his old truck, the 1972 Blue Scouts. Stainer hauled ass down the dirt road, while Joy looked for a way out. Being the badass that she was, Joey fought back against Stainer and even jumped out of the moving car head first. She managed to get to her feet and ran for her life. But Carrie Stainer, well, he was too quick and he came crashing through the brush right after her. He tackled Joey. He dragged her by the hair. This entire time, Joey fighting for her life. Stanner pulled out a knife and began carving up into the defenseless woman. But still, Joey continued to fight. Stanner dragged her deeper inside the woods and eventually overpowered her, driving his sharp knife deep inside her flesh. He took hold of Joey's legless body, dragged her to nearby Crane Creek, and there, he decapitated her entire head. Stainer later admitted to the police that he wanted to keep the head for himself as a souvenir, and then decided against it and left it there in the creek. Now, after the horrific discovery of Joey Armstrong's body, the FBI was called in. Before long, they questioned Carrie Stainer and even searched his truck, the one that Joey had just been in. But surprisingly, they let him go. But not for too long, that is. Because that's when an FBI agent named Jeff Rennick was tapped to go back and question Carrie Stainer again because something was definitely off with the peculiar handyman, and they believed he knew more than what he was letting on to. Rennick tracked Stainer down all the way up in Wilton, California, where he was staying at, of all places, a nudist camp called Laguna del Sol. Rennick, well, he and his partner convinced Stainer to ride with them to the local station for questioning. And during the ride, Stainer opened up about his brother Stephen and how a Hollywood movie about his kidnapping was made. He'd always been jealous of the notoriety his younger brother got, and he felt it was his turn now. Rennick sympathized with Stainer and quickly gained his trust. So much so that when they arrived at the station, Carrie Stainer admitted to the agent that he was indeed the Yosemite killer, confessed to all four killings. There's no question, Carrie Stainer lived his life with great jealousy of the fame that his younger brother Stephen gained after his heroic return from captivity. Carrie told Rennick that he should have a Hollywood movie made about his own life, and the trauma that he endured. But this never happened, thankfully. Carrie Stanner was prosecuted, found guilty, and sentenced to life in prison without parole. Stanner is currently 62 years old and resides in San Quentin Prison, overlooking the San Francisco Bay. Yosemite National Park has always been a place of refuge and wonder, and it took the Yosemite murders to shake the surrounding community to its core. But it also brought them closer together. In the aftermath of Carrie Stanner's reign of terror, Memorials and services were held to honor the victims and to begin the healing process. The community's resilience and determination to move forward played a crucial, crucial role in restoring Yosemite's spirit. And today, thankfully, Yosemite continues to welcome millions of visitors, offering solace, inspiration, and light to those who venture inside the park. Yosemite National Park will always endure a true testament to nature's resilience and the enduring spirit of those fortunate enough to get to experience it firsthand. And even though the shadows of the past may linger, they do not define the magnificent, magical place that it is. So until next time, my friends, stay curious, stay safe, and keep exploring, because you know I will, out here in this Bay Area Babylon. Still in the mood for more true crime? Me too. So let's get down to brass tacks and let me introduce you to my book pick for this episode. And that would be none other than Kim Cross's chilling bestseller, in light of all darkness, inside the Polly Kloss kidnapping and search for America's child. But be forewarned, my friends, because this just isn't another true crime novel. It's a dark, deeply dark descent into a story that gripped the entire nation by the throat and refused to let go. From the very first page, 
Cross paints a haunting portrait of that fateful night. October 1st, 1993, when 12-year-old Polly Kloss was snatched from a slumber party at her own home. Taken by a shadow that lurked outside her window, Polly's disappearance sent ripples of terror throughout the Bay Area, which then spiraled into a nationwide frenzy that made headlines coast to coast. With a pen dipped in fear and sorrow, Cross takes us right into that home to the moment when a night of giggles turned into a cacophony of screams. A night where childhood ended far too soon. Now what makes this book so bone-chilling is not just the narrative of the crime itself, but the meticulous step-by-step -step recounting of the investigation that followed. Cross plunges us deep into the desperate search led by detectives, FBI agents, and tons of volunteers who combed through the forest and searched the creeks and knocked on doors in the relentless quest to bring poor Polly home. But here's the kicker. Cross just doesn't tell us what happened, she makes us feel it. The dread, the uncertainty, the waiting, the horror of knowing that somewhere out there, a child was lost, stolen from the safety of her own bedroom. Kim Cross weaves together interviews, court documents, and harrowing first-hand accounts, all that show how Polly's kidnapping changed everything for her family, for her town, and for an entire nation that watched on in horror. The story introduces us to the eerie presence of the kidnapper, I won't give his name away, but whose cold and calculating actions make your skin absolutely crawl. And let me tell you, friends, this is more than just a criminal we're talking about here. It's the manifestation of every parent's worst nightmare, whose shadow looms over every single page, every line, every moment in this book. Cross does not spare the reader any of the heart-wrenching details that went into this case. She places us in the shoes of Mark Kloss, Polly's father, whose heartbreak is almost palpable, echoing throughout each chapter like a ghostly wail in the night. She also takes us inside the minds of Polly's friends who were there that fateful night, and whose memories of that terror linger like a thick fog over their lives. But the book also delves into the investigative side of unveiling this case in detail. Cross sheds light on the groundbreaking technologies and strategies employed by the FBI and local authorities, showing how this case became a turning point in the way missing child cases were handled. From the use of computerized facial recognition software to wide search efforts, we see how this crime advocated for great change, but at a cost. And then, of course, there is the darkness. A darkness that seeps into every single page, creeping into every corner of this story, reminding us of this fragile line between safety and chaos, between light and darkness. Cross does not allow us to forget that this is not just a story, it's reality. And one that sadly lived by so many. A reality where a child's laughter can be stuffed out in an instant, and where evil can knock on the door at any time of day or night. But this book isn't just a tale of terror, it's also a tribute. A tribute to Polly, to her spirit, and to the people who've refused to let her memory fade into the dark. It's a testament to the strength of a community, and the power of hope, even when faced with the most unspeakable of crimes. You're brave enough to step into the shadows and face the chilling reality of one of America's most haunting cases. And get to your local library and pick up, in light of all darkness. But be warned. This is a journey into the heart of darkness that will stay with you long after the book is closed. It will make you think twice about locking your doors and your windows at night, and it will make you hold your loved ones just a little bit closer, knowing that sometimes the monsters out there are all too real, especially out here in this Bay Area Babylon. <laughs>